This conference will now be recorded. Hello, everyone. A uh, warm welcome to CM Dental Academy. It's an online dental education platform in the field of dental surgery. We aim at delivering excellent quality online training programs and courses for the dental students under the guidance of eminent mentors. The subjects will be covered in all the formats such as live lectures, descriptive notes, MCQs, and Viva Voice questions. So what are you waiting for? Come, let's begin a journey towards success. In today's class, we are going to begin with restorative dentistry, periodontology part. So highlights of the class being the classification of the periodontal diseases, epidemiology, oral microbiology, etiology of periodontal disease, plaque biofilm, calculus, progression and risk factors, pathogenesis of gingivitis, clinical features of gingivitis and periodontitis, diagnosis and monitoring, aggressive periodontitis, necrotizing periodontal disease, periodontal abscess, periodontitis associated with endodontic lesions. Classification of periodontal disease. This is uh, going to be a very important and frequently asked question during your MFDS part one exam. The classification of periodontal and periimplant disease was revisited in 2017 and 18. Till then, the classification put forward in 1999 was accepted and used all over the world. In November 2017, the American Academy of Periodontology, the European Federation of Periodontology, together with the members from other countries around the world, met in Chicago to discuss the reclassification of periodontal health, disease, and peri-implant disease. This was presented in Europerio 9 in Amsterdam in 2018. This document is now referred to as the 2017 World Workshop on the Classification of Periodontal and Peri-Implant Diseases and Conditions. This is being the 1999 classification of periodontal diseases and conditions. I just wanted you all to know about what all the changes been done in 2017 and 18 classification. What are the advantages of this current classification and what are being the drawbacks? Initially, it was broadly classified as gingival diseases, chronic periodontitis, aggressive periodontitis, periodontitis as a manifestation of systemic disease, necrotizing periodontal diseases, abscesses of the periodontium, periodontitis associated with endodontic lesions, developmental or acquired deformities and conditions. The gingival diseases were further classified as the one which are plaque-induced and the ones with non-plaque-induced. Chronic periodontitis was classified as localized and generalized as same for the aggressive periodontitis and necrotizing periodontal diseases as gingivitis, necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis and necrotizing ulcerative periodontitis. In 2017 classification of periodontal and peri-implant diseases and conditions, it was broadly categorized into periodontal health, gingival disease and conditions in which the periodontal and gingival health, gingivitis and that is uh, dental biofilm induced and gingival diseases non-dental biofilm induced. Periodontitis was subclassified as necrotizing periodontal diseases, periodontitis as a manifestation of systemic disease. Other conditions affecting periodontium such as systemic diseases or conditions affecting the periodontal supporting tissues, periodontal abscesses and endodontic periodontal lesions, mucogingival deformities and conditions, traumatic occlusal forces, tooth and processes related factors, peri-implant diseases and conditions. In this, they are subcategorized as peri-implant health, mucositis, peri-implantitis, and soft tissue and heart tissue deficiencies.
The new classification system requires the clinician to not only diagnose periodontitis and whether it is localized or generalized, how it was previous, but to also comment on in which stage it is, in which grade of the disease it is, to reflect on whether the disease is stable or in remission phase or active phase, and finally to list the identified risk factors. The distribution of localized or generalized is still based on 30% of sites affected. If up to 30 or less than 30 is localized and more than 30% is categorized as generalized. The only risk factors included in World Workshop paper were diabetes, especially unstable diabetes and smoking were included. So in 2017 assessment of current periodontal status, it is categorized as currently stable based on if bleeding on probing is present only in less than 10% of the cases, pocket depth up to four millimeter or less than four millimeter, no bleeding on probing at four millimeter sites. It is in currently remission phase we can categorize only when bleeding on probing is more than 10% and uh, uh, periodontal pocket depth is less than four millimeter or equal to and no bleeding on probing at four millimeter sites. Currently unstable when periodontal pocket depth is more than five millimeter or uh, more than four millimeter or equal to four millimeter along with the bleeding on probing. It should be noted that in BSP implementation, that is British Society of Periodontology implementation document, they make the point that five millimeter or six millimeter pocket that does not bleed may not be unstable. Why? In 2017, the World Workshop on Classification of Periodontology Diseases has been widely accepted. The British Society of Periodontology felt that it was too complicated to be used in its own form. In early 2019, British Society of Periodontology published their document, Periodontal Diagnosis in the Context of 2017 Classification System of Periodontal Diseases and Conditions and its Implementation in Clinical Practice. This simpler system mirrors the style of the original document, but simplifies the staging and grading elements of the diagnosis to allow for easier use in general practice. So this is the British Society of Periodontology UK implementation for the gingivitis, clinical gingival health in case of a BP, that is a, um, basic periodontal examination code with 0, 1 or 2 with uh, less than 10% of bleeding on probing, localized gingivitis with these scores and the generalized gingivitis. The British Society of Periodontology UK implementation for the periodontitis, it categorized into based on the distribution that is molar incisor pattern, less than 30% is localized, uh, if less than 30% of teeth are involved and more than 30% of teeth are involved or equal to, also it is generalized form. The staging is, uh, they have categorized as stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. One is early or mild, stage two being the moderate where bone level in coronal third of the root. In stage three being the severe form, bone level in mid third of the root. Stage four is very severe form. Stage is assessed on the worst affected tooth based on which the staging is done. In case of grading, the percentage of bone loss or patient's age is estimated. Grade A being the slow lesion, B moderate, C rapid. Grade is assessed on the worst affected tooth. Same. The assessment of the current periodontal status in this, the currently stable where bleeding on probing is less than 10% with the periodontal pocket depth less than 4 millimeter and no bleeding on probing at 4 millimeter sites. Currently in remission phase to call it bleeding on probing more than 10% periodontal pocket depth 
less than 4 mm and no bleeding on probing at 4 mm sites. Currently in unstable form when the periodontal pocket depth is more than 5 mm or periodontal pocket depth is more than 4 mm along with bleeding on probing. It should be noted that in basic British Society of Periodontology implementation document, they make the point that 5 mm or 6 mm pocket that does not bleed may not be unstable. The risk factors included are the smoking and suboptimally controlled diabetes. Example of a diagnosis statement. Uh, how to diagnose it, uh, like uh, generalized periodontitis with stage 3, grade B, currently unstable with smoking as a risk factor. This is going to be the final diagnosis for a periodontitis patient, not just as a chronic uh, uh, generalized periodontitis or chronic uh, localized periodontitis, but this is going, be, uh, going to be the elaborate form of the diagnosis for a periodontitis patient. Let's begin with the epidemiology of the periodontal diseases, how it is worldwide distribu uh, distributed and uh, in what percentage it affects the specific type of the population, what is the cause of it. Epidemiology is the study of presence, severity and effect of disease on a population. This helps identify etiological and risk factors and effectiveness of preventive and therapeutic measures at a population level. Various scoring systems such as gingival, plaque and periodontal indices. Some for use at a population level for epidemiological studies used are community periodontal index, community periodontal index for treatment needs, that is CPITN, and some for routine screening and management of the individual patient, that is basic periodontal examination. So these are the indices used for mainly the epidemiological study of the periodontal diseases. Uh, there is no ideal index as such, uh, mild to moderate periodontitis affects commonly all the population, group of population. Severe periodontitis affects a relatively small subset of population. The risk factors being smoking, poorly controlled diabetes and colonization by specific bacteria at high level. These are the risk factors to cause the periodontitis. Localized aggressive periodontitis affects less than 0.1% to 0.2% of Caucasians and 22% of Afro-Caribbeans. And generalized aggressive periodontitis affects less than 5% of the population. Basic periodontal examination. Uh, basic periodontal examination was uh, developed from the CPITN. It is a simple screening tool that will be used to determine whether uh, further examination is needed and therefore it provides a direction of the next phase of the treatment. This technique is used to screen those patients who require more detailed periodontal examination in dental settings. It examines every tooth in the mouth except the third molars. In basic periodontal examination, third molars are excluded. Thus taking into account the site-specific nature of the periodontal disease. WHO periodontal probe is used for this purpose for basic periodontal examination. It has a ball end which is 0.5 millimeter. You can see here a ball end of 0.5 millimeter in diameter and then colored normally black band is present from uh, 3.5 to 5.5 millimeter. You can see a black band extending here. Markings present are 3.5 to 5.5 millimeter. The uh, using this probe, how screening is performed? That is the basic periodontal examination. How it is performed? Uh, the mouth is divided into six stands. 
In each extant, the mouth is screened for two buccal surfaces and one labial segment per arch. All teeth in each segment are explored and then the highest score per sextant is recorded. Usually in a simple six box chart, it is, readings are documented. The probe will be walked around the sulcus in each sextant with the light probing force of 20 to 25 grams. This is very commonly asked also the force, uh, the amount of probing force required in basic periodontal examination uh, it is going to be 20 to 25 grams and the highest score is recorded in each sextant for the sextant to qualify for recording it must contain at least two teeth so this is going to be the criteria this is all about the basic periodontal examination so when to record the basic periodontal examination all new patients should have BPE recording, including children and adults. For patients with BPE code 0, 1 or 2 on a previous BPE recording, the BPE should be allowed up to each follow-up examination. And for patients with BPE codes 3 and 4, further detailed periodontal charting would be, would be needed and further treatment is indicated in the following sections. It should not be used around the implants. Six point pocket charting is recommended instead. When uh, zero score is given, if the pockets are less than 3.5 millimeter and first black band is completely visible, usually seen in case of the healthy periodontal tissues, no bleeding after gentle probing, no calculus and no overhangs on the restorations. So no need of the treatment for periodon periodontium. Score one is given when there are pockets uh, more than 3.5 millimeter, pockets less than 3.5 millimeter, and the first black band is completely visible, but there are signs of gingival bleeding after gentle probing, pockets uh, more than three millimeter, no calculus, no plaque retaining factors such as overhang restorations. Special investigations would not be needed. However, it is important to note that any recession would be unaccounted for. The treatment being for score one is usually the uh, oral hygiene instructions. Uh, score two, when pockets are more than 3.5 millimeter, black band is visible, uh, but plaque retention factors are present, such as calculus or overhang of the restoration. In case of score three, the colored area of the probe remains partly visible in deepest pocket in sextant. And score four, the colored area of probe disappears into the pocket. One or more teeth in sextant has a pocket more than six millimeter. And uh, percussion involvement, when more detailed periodontal charting is required for the entire dentition, plaque and bleeding charts can be recorded as a part of special investigation. It would uh, also include the radiographs as a special investigation. For uh, treatment being, uh, according to the basic periodontal index code, more complex treatment and referral, referral to the specialist may be necessary. Uh, one more thing I just want to add, the basic periodontal examination probing is not appropriate for the implant sites. This being the drawback of this BPE. The soft tissues uh, section on uh, to implant is not the same as the teeth surrounding the soft tissue around the implant. Therefore, peri-implant soft tissues are less resistant to probing. In addition, the position of implant in relation to bone and soft tissues may present deeper probing depths. And it also cannot be used to monitor the response to periodontal treatment because it cannot provide information on how sites are changing during the follow-ups within the sextant after the treatment. Like after the first phase of treatment is uh, performed and patient is recalled for the follow-up, we cannot perform this BP examination because it will not monitor the response of the periodontal tissue in between the follow-ups. So uh, basic periodontal examination is just a screening tool. 
these are being the drawbacks of this basic periodontal examination oral microbiology which uh, microorganisms which contribute to the gingivitis and the periodontitis this is a very vast subject for a subject to study but i have added only few important topics and the microorganisms uh, in the pres my presentation you can go through them later i will just uh, explain it out to you all in brief the mouth is colonized by many organisms immediately few hours after the birth around 700 different species can colonize the mouth and more than 400 species may be found in the periodontal pockets in health there is a balanced relationship between oral flora and host defense the resident microflora are important in preventing colonization by exogenous microbes so whenever the biofilm forms on the teeth the composition of biofilm is mainly gram positive and facultative anaerobes they metabolize host and dietary sugars biofilms in case of periodontal pockets it contains large amount of obligate anaerobes obligate anaerobes are nothing but the organisms which grow in the absence of oxygen also uh, there are some gram negative rods and cocci and are proteolytic which break down the protein so there are streptococcus mutants groups or streptococcus oralis group salivarius group and intermediate group lactobacilli uh, secondary colonizers in caries are seen usually they are very acidogenic and uh, often found in dentine caries porphyromonas gingivalis are obligate anaerobes associated with chronic periodontitis and aggressive periodontitis uh, i just want you all to know which all the bacteria are associated with which particular uh, gingival or periodontal diseases i have enumerated a few aggregate bacteria actinomycetum comitans it is micro aerophilic capnophilic gram negative rod particular pathogen in aggressive periodontitis tanerella uh, fossithia are the anaerobic gram negative bacteria implicated in periodontal diseases Prevotella intermedia found in chronic periodontitis, um, localized aggressive periodontitis, necrotizing periodontal disease, and areas of severe gingival inflammation without attachment loss. And nigricans being the newest uh, form detected and seems to be more virulent. Capnophilic microorganisms are the organisms which thrive in the presence of high concentration of carbon dioxide. Fusobacterium are also obligate anaerobes which grow in the absence of uh, oxygen. Uh, they remain significant in the periodontal pathogen with the symbiosis dysbiosis theory. Quorum sensing organisms, these are called as their main function is quorum sensing. Uh, it is nothing, quorum sensing is nothing but a communication mechanism that is between the bacteria that allows the specific process to be controlled, such as the biofilm formation, virulence factor expression, production of secondary metabolites. It, these all mechanisms will be controlled by these group of bacteria. That's why these are called as the quorum sensing organisms. So these group of bacteria, that is the fusobacterium, can elicit a stronger host response. Uh, the spirochetes being obligate anaerobes implemented in periodontal diseases, and these are present in most commonly adult mouths. Borrelia vincenti, local oral spirochete, probably only a co-pathogen. Actinomyces is really, it causes actinomyces. And Candida albicans, it is a yeast-like fungus famous as an opportunistic oral pathogen, probably carried as a commensal by most people. Just I have listed a few most common bacteria found in the oral cavity and their association with the gingival and periodontal diseases. Etiology of the periodontal diseases. The primary etiology of virtually all forms of periodontal disease being the formation of the plaque it exists in a biofilm form at subgingival margin and can progress 
supra gingival margin sorry and can progress to sub gingiva plaque biofilm causes gingivitis by inducing an inflammatory host response the inflammatory response of gingiva to the presence of initial young plaque leads to gingival inflammatory changes which further leads to minute gingival pockets uh, these minute gingival pockets further uh, bacterial colonization and providing all the nutrients for the growth of the numerous fastidious organisms an extremely low oxygen level within the gingival pockets which favors the development of obligate anaerobes such several of which are closely associated with the progression of the periodontal disease so this is going to be the etiology first there is a plaque which leads to the biofilm formation inflammation of the inflammatory host response occurs then the growth of the microorganism how it favors the growth of the microorganism and the periodontal disease high level of carbon dioxide favors establishment of capnophilic organisms because these are the organisms which thrive in the presence of uh, carbon dioxide and these organisms are associated with uh, localized aggressive periodontitis healthy gingiva contains uh, gram positive rods and cocci and uh, which are facultatively anaerobic or aerobic Gingivitis has facultative anaerobes, strict anaerobes, and an increased number of gram negative rods. Established periodontitis usually has anaerobic gram negative rods. In 1996, World Workshop in Periodontics, uh, they reported that aggregative bacter actinomycetum comitans. Porphyromonas gingivalis and Tanerella fossitia. These are being the most commonly associated bacteria with the periodontitis. But I have enlisted few other bacteria which have been documented to be recently associated with the gingivitis, such as Prevotella, Intermedia, Nigricens, Melanino, Genica, Fusobacterium, Nucleatum, Peptostreptococcus, Micros, Eubacterium species, Echinella. Corridens and uh, Selenomonas species, Treponema denticola and Campylobacter rectus. These also are associated with the periodontitis. So there is a strong association between these actinomycetum comitans and the localized aggressive periodontitis. Association of some viruses in progressive uh, progression of the periodontal disease is being proven. The role of plaque in the etiology. There are four hypotheses put forward for the role of plaque in the etiology of the uh, etiology of the periodontal diseases, such as the non-specific plaque hypothesis, specific plaque hypothesis, ecological plaque hypothesis, and symbiosis dysbiosis. The non-specific plaque hypothesis states that the theory, the disease is outcome of overall activity of the total plaque microflora and not because of a particular strain of a bacteria, rationally for surgical and non-surgical treatment. According to the specific plaque hypothesis, only a few species in the plaque microflora are actively involved in the disease, and it is a rational for use of antimicrobials. Ecological plaque hypothesis states that elements of both the first two, two hypotheses, such as local environmental changes arising from inflammation due to plaque accumulation can cause etiological shift in the microflora, likely to produce more inflammation with the rationale for interfering with the environmental factors that drive changes in host or microflora balance. Plaque removal or altering the pocket environment to suppress the growth. Then lastly being the symbiosis dysbiosis. This considers the previous three hypotheses and develops it further. While the etiological plaque hypothesis takes into account that a shift in the microflora towards a more pathogenic biofilm produces more inflammation. This in itself is not sufficient to cause the periodontitis. 
It results from more complex interactions between the biofilm and inflammatory immune response from the host. A health promoting biofilm would trigger a host response that is more resolving and thus symbiotic relationship between the biofilm and host response. Host promotes the health. If the biofilm is not disrupted regularly, certain species such as Fusobacterium nucleatum are favored. These enable a strong host response and thus create the conditions that promote the development and growth of traditional pathogens such as Porphyromonas gingivalis. This is known as incipient dysbiosis because in non-susceptible individuals, the inflammation does not progress beyond gingivitis. However, in susceptible individuals, incipient dysbiosis can trigger a host response that is excessive, resulting in collateral periodontal tissue damage. These are the four theories uh, or hypotheses put for the role of plaque in the etiology of the periodontal diseases. But what are the virulent factors? Being the adherents, the proteases, bone resorption factors, the cytotoxic metabolites, leukotoxins, induction of the inflammatory response via cytokines and the ch uh, chemotaxins. Host response, both the inflammatory, uh, in, in, inflammatory and immunologically mediated pathways can contribute to the periodontal damage, such as innate host defense. In this, epithelium acts as a physical barrier if junctional epithelium develops into pocket epithelium, its protective function is to its permeable structure. Supragingivalis saliva prevents drying of the oral tissues and has antimicrobial effect via salivary immunoglobulin A, peroxidases, lysozyme, and lactoferrin. The inflammatory response is relatively nonspecific. This is a fluid component in the form of gingival crevicular fluid. This washes out on adherent bacteria from the crevice and contains inflammatory mediators such as cytokines, prostaglandins, matrix metalloproteinases. The cellular component includes the neutrophils and macrophages. This, this is being the innate host uh, defense. Coming to the specific immune response, it is categorized as humoral response, which involves the antibody production and the cell-mediated response by production of T helper cells, which produce cytokines, assist in differentiation of the B cells to with, uh, which further leads to formation of the plasma cells and activate neutrophils and macrophages. Plaque biofilm. A dental plaque, which is a biofilm, is an adherent mass of diverse microorganisms in a mucopolysaccharide matrix. It cannot be rinsed off but can be removed by brushing. These are made up of symbiotic communities of different microorganisms and develop in a structured way, spatially and functionally organized. Resident bacteria can dampen the immune response via communication with mucosal cells. If this balanced coexistence breaks down, disease occurs. It forms in stages such as the biofilm formation. Initially, cocci predominate for the first two days. Following the filamentous organisms will be involved. It is associated with increased number of the leukocytes at the gingiva. Uh, around six to 10 days, if uh, there is no proper cleaning is being done or no proper oral hygiene instructions are performed, vibrios and spirochetes appear in plaque and this is associated with the clinical gingivitis around six to 10 days of the time. If it is generally felt that the move from a gram negative anaerobic dense plaque associated with the progression of the gingivitis and the periodontal diseases. I would just like to summarize it as plaque biofilm develops in a structured manner. Formation begins as an acquired pellicle. Streptococci are the early species to develop. Formation of a biofilm and presence of plaque has a direct correlation with the gingivitis. 
Fusobacterium nucleatum are quorum sensing species, means which regulate other factors that can initiate the environmental changes towards the more pathogenic species. Incipient dysbiosis may occur if the host response is such that there is resulting periodontal tissue damage, frank dysbiosis will occur. Calculus, which is commonly known as starter, is a calcified deposit found in teeth or it is formed by mineralization of the plaque deposits. Supragingival calculus formed by uh, saliva, while subgingival calculus is mainly formed by the gingival cravicular fluid. Supragingival calculus present opposite the opening of the salivary ducts in case of first and second molars in the maxilla. Uh, the secretory, uh, salivary secretions expelled from the Stenson's duct and on the lingual surface of the lower anterior teeth opposite uh, the submandibular and the sublingual duct openings. Usually we see the supragingival calculus deposits. The subgingival calculus is found underneath the gingival margin. It is firmly attached to the tooth roots, appear brown or black in color. It may be identified usually detected by touch using a BPE or CPITN probe. It is associated with subsequent periodontitis in some cases. Composition. Uh, mostly calculus is composed of 80% of organic salts which are crystalline in nature formed of calcium and phosphorus. The microscopically they are composed of randomly oriented crystals. They are of four different morphological types such as octacalcium phosphate, hydroxyapatite, whitlockite and brushite. These are the four forms. Uh, so now the question is how the cal uh, calculus formation occurs. It is always preceded by plaque deposition. Without plaque deposition, there is further progression to calculus won't occur. The plaque serving as an organic matrix for subsequent mineralization. Initially, the matrix between the organisms become calcified. This is the first phase. Eventually, the organisms themselves become mineralized. Subgingival calculus usually takes many months to form, whereas friable supragingival may form within two weeks. Anti-calculus dentifrices are used, which contain, um, which acts by inhibiting the growth of the crystals, uh, which contain triclosan, zinc citrate to prevent formation of the supragingival calculus, but seems to be less effective against the subgingival deposits. Progression and risk factors for the gingival and the periodontal diseases. Progression from gingivitis to periodontitis can occur as there is a shift from friendly normal commensals of bacteria to periodontopathic bacteria and their products and host response that ensues. It involves uh, such as oral environment, the pathogenicity of the organisms, host defense and plaque maturity. Sometimes what happens in few individuals may have a large amount of plaque without developing it into periodontitis. In few what happens, they may have a periodontal destruction, which is very obvious, but relatively small amount of plaque. Why is it so? Because it mainly depends on the above mentioned factors, such as oral environment, the pathogenicity. In small amount of plaque, the uh, amount of pathogenic bacteria present may differ from the pathogenic bacteria present in large amount of plaque. Or the host defense shown in the two uh, different kinds of individuals and the plaque maturity. These factors are correlated. Local risk factors are those which predispose to plaque accumulation, for example, tooth position and morphology, calculus, overhangs and appliances, occlusal trauma and mucogingival state. The systemic factors which modify the host response are smoking, diabetes, obesity, genetic factors, immune status, stress, age and nutrition. Periodontal diseases and risk for systemic diseases there is a stronger association and possible causation associated with the type 1 diabetes. 
the pathogenesis of gingivitis and the periodontitis. The pathogenesis of gingivitis and periodontitis is uh, studied broadly as an initial lesion, early lesion, established lesion, and advanced lesion. So what happens in the initial lesion once the uh, condition begins? Overall, gingivitis and periodontitis are a continuum of the same condition, but gingivitis does not always progress to periodontitis. Initial lesion begins at 24 hours. There will be vasodilatation in the adjacent gingival tissue. At around two to four days, increased cellular gaps. There is a gap between two cells. Therefore, the gingival crevicular fluid flushes noxious substances away and releases the antibodies, complement, and protease inhibitors. Along with this, few neutrophils and lymphocytes and macrophages also appear. In initial lesion state, the gingiva appears clinically healthy. In early lesion, once of about around after one week, there is increased number of the vascular units. Therefore, clinically, there is a erythema. Lymphocytes and neutrophils predominate with few plasma cells. Fibroblasts degenerate and collagen fibers break down. The basal cells of the junctional epithelium and circular epithelium proliferate to form the retapex in adjacent connective tissue. Subgingival biofilm develops as junctional epithelium loses contact with enamel. It may persist for a long time without shifting to the established lesion. These are the sequence of events which take in every phase and the disease further progresses. In established lesion, gingival crevicular fluid flow increases. Neutrophils predominate. There are a number of lymphocytes and plasma cells in connective tissue and junctional epithelium. This junctional epithelium converts to, into pocket epithelium. Clinically, gingiva appears red, swollen, and bleeds easily. Established lesion remains stable with no progression for months together or years together or may convert to the destructive advanced lesion. In early lesion also, lesion stays stagnant for a long period of time before it progresses to established lesion. Even in the phase of established lesion also, the lesion progression is stagnant for years also. Once it progresses to advanced lesion, the pockets deepen the biofilm. It continues to develop apically. The migration, apical migration of the junctional epithelium occurs. Formation of a true pockets aligned with pocket epithelium occurs. Inflammatory cell infiltrates extend further apically into the connective tissue. Plasma cell dominate and now con constitute more than 50% of the cellular infiltrate. Initially, there will be neutrophils, lymphocytes, and macrophages in initial lesion. In early lesion, there will be presence of lymphocytes and the neutrophils. Established lesion has neutrophils. In case of advanced lesion, the plasma cells predominate. There is a loss of connective tissue attachment and alveolar bone, which represents the onset of the periodontitis. The disease is initiated and maintained by substances produced by the biofilm cause direct injury to the host cell and some cause tissue injury by activation of host inflammatory and immune response. Initially, pockets will be shallow around 4 to 5 millimeter when the lesion begins, representing 1 to 2 millimeter of clinical attachment loss. Bone loss is likely to be horizontal with supra bony pockets. As the disease progress, these pockets deepen. The clinical attachment loss also increases. As the lesion progresses from initial lesion to advanced lesion, bone loss may be vertical with infra bony pockets once it reaches the advanced lesion. The transition from gingivitis to periodontitis is difficult to predict and susceptibility varies from side to side. It may not be uh, like uh, in all the teeth affected with the gingivitis which are progressing to periodontitis will be in the same phase. The phase uh, in which individual tooth is varies. The disease progression is measured by clinical attachment loss or probing pocket depth measurements. 
So these are the sequence of events you should be thorough with. What are the changes occur in which phase? Uh, why it is initial lesion? When the clinical obvious signs appear, which cells predominate in each step? Now the clinical features of gingivitis and periodontitis differentiation. Gingivitis is a classic triad of redness, swelling and bleeding on gentle probing are diagnostic and are usually associated with complaint by the patient that gums are bleeding on brushing. The knife edge margins and uh, loss of stippling which is replaced by more rounded shiny appearance of the gingiva. Pain is not usually a feature. Halitosis may be present or may not and affects gingiv gingiva only. In case of periodontitis, gingival inflammation, it appears also as uh, bleeding and uh, pocket uh, pocket gingival uh, periodontal pockets gingival recession tooth mobility migration discomfort and halitosis it affects gingiva periodontal ligament cementum and alveolar bone chronic periodontitis affects entire periodontium it it is classified as localized when less than 30% of teeth are involved and generalized when more than 30% of teeth are involved. Staging reveals the degree of attachment loss while grading signifies the progression of the disease to date. These are the broad differences between the gingivitis and the chronic periodontitis. Patients with an intact periodontium are categorized as health, when the probing attachment loss is absent, periodontal pocket depth is only 3 millimeter or less than 3 millimeter. Bleeding on probing is less than 10% and there is no any radiographic bone loss. To categorize it as gingivitis, there has to be periodontal pocket depth more uh, three, around 3 millimeter and the bleeding on probing present around more than 10 millimeter and uh, no radiographic loss even in gingivitis and uh, patients with the reduced periodontium when health there is no attachment loss yet and periodontal pocket depth less than three millimeter or equal to bleeding on probing less than 10 percent no radiographic bone loss in case of gingivitis probing attachment loss is present and a periodontal pocket depth is less than three millimeter. Bleeding on probing is more than or equal to 10% and radiographic bone loss is possible. Diagnosis and monitoring. So to come to a particular diagnosis and uh, uh, come to a specific monitoring and of the patient with the periodontal diseases, a thorough history taking place a vital role. Achieving a periodontal diagnosis is a process of collecting all the information, including uh, obtaining a good history. Identify the patients presenting complaint, which may include like bleeding, drifted teeth, abscesses, mobile teeth, loss of some teeth, patients sometimes complain. So you have to know what is the cause for the loss of teeth, receding gums. It is always important to identify the reason and also patient's concerns and main aims. What exactly patient is complaining of? It is important at this point to elicit the patient's attitude towards the treatment and his previous any dental visits or treatment experiences or any other contributing factors such as uh, systemic factors and uh, risk factors such as smoking or uh, poorly controlled diabetes. Sometimes patients will be on um, anticoagulants for medication. That all will be revealed under a thorough history taking or recording. Then clinical examination. There is a need to assess plaque control, presence of supra and subgingival calculus, loss of gingival contour, swelling, suppuration, recession of periodontal tissues, pocketing, furcation lesions, local risk factors, tooth mobility. These all factors provide an exact idea about the periodontal status. Then the basic periodontal examination provides an overview of the periodontal status. A few indices can also be used such as marginal bleeding index, plaque index, periodontal pocketing. 
this periodontal pocketing is classified as false pockets and true pockets. False pockets are due to gingival enlargement with the pocket epithelium at or above the amylocemental junction in cases such as altered active eruption. These are called as the false pockets and the true pockets being the apical migration of the junctional epithelium beyond the amylocemental junction and can be divided into suprabony and intrabony pockets. Suprabony or intrabony defects are normally deduced from a combination of clinical parameters such as pocket depth and from radiographic intervention. Suprabony defects may be described as horizontal bone loss and intrabony are as a vertical bone loss. Intrabony defects are described further as three wall defects. That is most favorable. Uh, in this, what happens is it is as it is surrounded on three sides by the cancerous bone. Three sides, there is a presence of bone and one side, there is a presence of cementum of, or of the root. In two wall defect, either a crater between the teeth having bone on two walls and the cementum on the other two or have two bony walls. In one wall defect, maybe hemiseptal through and through defect or have one bony wall, two root, cementum and one soft tissue. Probing pocket depth. What is probing pocket depth? It is measured from the gingival margin to the estimated base of the pocket. Clinical attachment levels or clinical attachment loss. Measured from a fixed reference point, that is cementoenamel junction or margin of a restoration to the base of the pocket. Pockets are therefore dependent on the position of the gingival margin. If recession is present, then how to record the clinical attachment loss? In such situation, the clinical attachment loss is recorded as recession plus periodontal probing depth that together contributes to the clinical attachment loss. Types of periodontal probes used. These are the key instruments in detecting pockets. Numerous designs exist while individual preference will influence the choice. It is sensible to reduce variability by selecting a single type of probe and using that type of probe throughout one individual treatment. You cannot change one. Uh, you can use a different probe and next time you can use a different probe because the reading will differ and it becomes difficult to keep a track on individual progress. The use of WHO probe for screening is described in case of basic periodontal examination. And patients with the periodontitis should further be investigated, including probing around each tooth. So the probing variables include type of probe and its position, amount of pressure used and degree of inflammation, which I have explained earlier. Then mobility is assessed using grade one, grade two, grade three. When there is less than one millimeter horizontal mobility, it is classified as grade one. Uh, more than one millimeter horizontal mobility and no vertical displacement is classified as grade two. And grade three, when there is vertical displacement or tooth in its socket is possible. It is categorized as grade three mobility. Radiographic examination. Usually uh, horizontal bite wing radiographs, vertical bite wings radiographs, full mouth periapicals, usually long gulf parallel technique is performed and full mouth periapical radiographs. There is no indication for dental panoramic tomography. For routine screening purpose, it is not required. So making uh, records, um, assessment of dental radiographs should be recorded in, in the notes format, such as degree of bone loss, the pattern of bone loss, whether it is angular or versus horizontal and any forcation involvement, if uh, presence of forcation involvement for the individual tooth and any subgingival deposits are present, any other features such as periodontal endodontic lesions, widened periodontal ligament spaces, overhang restorations, abnormalities in root length or morphology. So the diagnosis and uh, monitoring, 
uh, diagnosis is based on new classification system which we have discussed in the beginning itself and uh, monitoring the results of radiographs clinical assessment and uh, assessment of pocket depth can all be marked on the up updatable periodontal chart to monitor the progress with the treatment it helps so i would just like to summarize how to approach the diagnosis and monitoring a thorough good history is mandatory consider any medical or systemic factors or any other risk factors such as smoking conduct basic periodontal examination recording and a more advanced six point periodontal charting for greater bp scores take appropriate radiographs for monitoring consider your diagnosis from a periodontal perspective based on the classification system and any other associated diagnosis for example periodontal endodontic lesions or any caries etc aggressive periodontitis it was described as a type of periodontitis in 1999 classification and replaced disease terminology like early onset periodontitis in previous system of classification the new 2017 classification does not recognize aggressive periodontitis as a separate disease i just want you all to throw some light on these changes made previous and the recent classification and comments that it is merely an extreme presentation of the same disease that is periodontitis it is often associated with aggregative bacter actinomycetum comitans and porphyromonas gingivalis appears as two main forms such as generalized aggressive periodontitis and uh, it was previously known as generalized juvenile periodontitis and localized aggressive periodontitis where it was known as localized juvenile periodontitis the generalized aggressive periodontitis is the severe form of generalized periodontitis affecting young adults which who are less than 30 years of the age generalized interproximal attachment loss affects at least three permanent teeth other than first molars and incisors there is a pronounced episodic nature of the destruction of attachment and alveolar bone the poor serum antibody response to infecting agent it affects one to two percent of the western population with an increase in afro-caribbeans the localized aggressive periodontitis is a severe form of a localized periodontitis with the onset around puberty it, it it shows localized attachment loss of at least two permanent teeth one of which is a first molar and involving no more than two teeth other than first molar and incisors robust serum antibody response to infecting agents so the treatment for this condition being achievement of adequate supragingival plaque control subgingival instrumentation to disrupt biofilm but this may not eradicate virulent organisms non-surgical approach with adjunctive use of systemic antibiotics is the preferred treatment option amoxicillin or metronidazole combination seems to provide additional benefit to non-surgical management in the situation where amoxicillin or metronidazole cannot be prescribed azithromycin has a good evidence base so surgery has a role but there is no consensus regarding the use of systemic antibiotics for this approach increased evidence uh, that regenerative surgical techniques are a suitable option for defects associated with aggressive periodontitis regular supportive care is important these are being the uh, line of treatment for patients with the aggressive periodontitis necrotizing periodontal diseases uh, these are the destructive painful inflammatory condition which is rapid debilitating and usually runs as an acute course it includes necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis necrotizing ulcerative periodontitis and necrotizing stomatitis where the necrotizing lesion has spread to include tissues beyond the mucogingival junction it presents necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis it presents as a painful ulcerated necrotic papillae and gingival margins with a punched out appearance this is the characteristic clinical appearance of necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis ulcers are usually covered by a pseudomembranous gray slough 
associated with metallic taste patient most of the time complaints of metallic taste sensation of teeth being wedged apart and fitter oris interproximal crater develops with loss of crystal bone and in some cases bony sequestra loss of attachment and development of um, necrotizing ulcerative periodontitis may occur regional lymphadenitis fever and malaise feature in some cases can be confused with the primary herpetic gingivostomatitis it rarely occurs in children in northern europe and us prevalence is increased in developing countries it is associated with poor oral hygiene, but stress and smoking are the cofactors which contributes to the necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis. Immune suppression, including HIV and predisposed to ANA, usually limited gingival condition, but rare in some uh, serious form known as cancromoris or noma. It is found in patients who are usually malnourished. In this form can lead to extensive destruction of jaw and face. So, the necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis, what it uh, contains microscopically, it is caused by the fusiform or spirochete bacteria, contains Prevotella intermedia, fusobacteria species, Salmonella, and Treponema species. Crucial aspect of necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis is that it is a gram negative anaerobic infection which has been shown to actually invade the tissues but usually responds to local debridement so the initial treatment being the removal of the gross deposits of the plaque and the calculus uh, with or without local anesthesia patient most of the time complains of pain so it depends. Ultrasonics are useful due to their flushing action. Chlorhexidine rinses are also uh, recommended just as an adjunct to brushing as patient is initially under pain. Usually local measures will suffice if systemic upset. Metronidazole 200 milligram three times a day for three days is indicated. Penicillins are also effective. Once the ulcer have healed, non-surgical periodontal treatment can be carried out and smoking cessation advice is being given. Later treatment, example gingivectomy or persistent craters is only rarely required. Periodontal abscess. This is a localized collection of pus within the tissues adjacent to the periodontal pockets. It occurs either due to the introduction of virulent organisms into an existing pocket or decreased drainage potential. The latter classically occurs during the treatment as a reduction of inflammation in the coronal gingival tissue, which occludes drainage by a tighter adaption to the tooth. It may also occur due to the impaction of a foreign body such as fish bone or in a pre-existing pocket or even in otherwise a healthy periodontal tissue. Not necessary, always there should be a cause. Commonly occurs in furcation areas, may get a super infections with opportunistic organisms following systemic antibiotics in patients with untreated periodontal diseases. Multiple or recurrent abscesses may indicate underlying immunosuppression. For example, purely, uh, poorly controlled diabetes. Clinically, there may be swelling, pus from a pocket or sinus pain, tenderness to percussion and signs of periodontitis. There may be also a systemic involvement. So how to differentiate this from the uh, other diseases such as the gingival uh, abscesses, periodontal, uh, pericoronal abscesses, periapical abscesses, combined periodontal endodontic lesions. Uh, for this, insertion of a gutta percha point into an associated sinus. Uh, after inserting it, a radiograph has to be taken to um, trace its course. It will help in differentiation uh, about of, of this lesion with the gingival abscesses and pericoronal abscesses or periapical abscesses. Emergency treatment being always the incision and drainage under the local anesthesia. The systemic antibiotics such as metronidazole 200 to 400 milligrams for three times a day, even amoxicillin uh, 250 to 500 milligrams three times a day for five days is uh, if there is a systemic involvement. Further treatment includes mechanical debridement and after the acute problem has settled to avoid iatrogenic damage to healthy periodontal tissues adjacent to the lesion. 
During follow-up, conventional treatment for peri periodontal pockets are combined with the periodontal endodontic lesion. So what are the difference between the periapical abscesses and periodontal abscesses? In case of periapical abscess, usually tooth is non-vital, tender to percussion vertically, may be mobile and loss of lamina dura on the x-rays. In case of periodontal abscesses, usually tooth is vital, pain on the lateral movements, and usually tooth is mobile, loss of alveolar crest on the x-rays are visible. So periodontitis associated with the endodontic lesions. A combined periodontal endodontic lesion is where both the lesions coalesce regardless of whether the origin is primarily periodontal, that is necrotic pulp due to the periodontal involvement, or primarily endodontic, that is periodontal tissues are involved after the pulp necrosis. Relative frequency of both periodontal disease and periapical pathology. It is not surprising that both may occur together, resulting in diagnostic confusion. There is little evidence to support the popular notion that periodontitis leads to pulp necrosis. However, there is no doubt that pulp pathology can exacerbate the periodontal problems because all the pulp, dis uh, pulp diseases uh, drains into the periodontium after all. So these are uh, perio-endo or endo-perio lesions. Uh, both are interconnected. Treatment being firstly, the resolve the acute infection and inflammation by drainage or uh, antibiotics, then treat with the root canal treatment. The greater the pulpal component, better the prognosis of the tooth. The apparent periodontal lesion will often be seen to resolve to a a substantial degree over a period of months. Therefore, the decision to carry out surgery should be deferred. Combined, periapic, combined apical surgery and periodontal surgery is quite feasible but carries a poor uh, long-term prognosis. The worst prognosis applies to those teeth where the periapical or pulpal pathology has been due entirely to apical extension of the periodontal pocket. These are often diagnosed after the fact when endodontics completely fail to resolve the region. So the correct uh, lesion uh, tracing and the diagnosis symptoms, if they are followed, we can have whether the lesion is associated with the periodontitis or the endodontitis and required investigation have to be uh, performed at a particular interval of time so that uh, the confusion can be resolved. So that's all about today's topics. In the next class, we'll be discussing with the non-surgical and surgical aspects of periodontology. Meanwhile, I'll be discussing MCQs about this topic in our free Telegram group. Any doubts or queries, you all are welcome to discuss in the group. Also, I would be happy if you all drop me a feedback regarding the today's session. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience and for your active participation. I would say the best way to predict future is to create it. Thank you.